Welcome to GothCast, episode 24. I'm Dr. Sanders. And I'm Robbie Gore. And today we're talking about what is considered one of the prime examples of a death rock band. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about 45 Grave today. And whenever you search death rock, probably the two most famous bands that are going to come up are going to be either Christian Death or 45 Grave. And it's a very interesting you know, idea because they're both very different bands in... I think uh, you want to take this explanation a little bit, so uh, go ahead. Yeah, so for 45 Grave and a lot of death rock bands, it's kind of a strange genre, you know, especially today, a lot of death rock bands, they tend to kind of limit themselves to the most memorable songs of death rock music. Yeah. You know, where it's usually kind of aggressive punk store you know mostly punk oriented but yeah. like kind of like a sisters of mercy sort of like drum sound or you know a little bit electronic but very aggressive they're very like hardcore la punk based but then they kind of incorporate other things into their sound that make them more goth ish which yeah. is kind of i think where the death rock name comes from yeah so that's usually what people think of when they think of death rock you know it's like punk music and a gothic, you know, like if punk and goth had like a kid or something. Yep. Now, 45 Grave, well, yes, I would agree that a lot of songs are very much death rock, you know, for what people consider that genre. There's so much in the 45 Grave, you know, the elements to their music and the sounds in their music. Yeah. That especially, you know, if you don't just listen to the singles, if you're not just listening to Party Time and Evil and, you know, like Wax or Black Cross you find that there's a ton of different influences. There's stuff that sounds kind of like metal or, you know, things like Black Sabbath. There's things that sound like classic rock. There's lots of surf uh, rock and rock yeah, really stuff. Yeah, surf influences. You have kind of like novelty songs <laughs> kind of in there. Yeah. There's so much of a range of different kinds of styles. And I think it's funny because if you look at the other, you know, what's really considered one of the biggest death rock bands, you know, is Christian Death. You see a lot of changing in that band, too, you know, that there wasn't really a defined sound. You know, of course, everybody always knows Only Theater Pain. Yeah. But when we looked at Ashes, which is, you know, Christian Death's, I think, third album, and with Roz Williams still, <laughs> you know. Yeah. There's all these different things that had changed from Only Theater Pain. You know, you have a kind of David Bowie sort of sound. You have the song Lament, which is kind of like this keyboard-driven, I mean, really interesting kind of music. And so when we're talking about 45 Grave and, and Death Rock in general, I think it's kind of important to note that, especially if you're going back and you know, listen to this, or it's the first time you're going to listen to 45 Grave, um, especially, I mean, we mentioned it kind of with Christian Death that the sound changed dramatically, but yeah, 45 Grave, I think if you're going in expecting like what is technically today considered a Death Rock band, you know, which is kind of has a, a little bit of a, more of a limited view of what people will consider Death Rock. Yeah, kind of an idea you, that they're going to sound a little bit like you know, Christian Death's first album. Yeah, I mean, you're going to be kind of confused because there is a ton of different stuff on these albums. And yes, there are songs that are very punk, but there's also a lot of slower material and a lot of different things going on with 45 Grave. And I think that a lot of the earlier bands weren't quite as restrictive because, you know, they were just kind of figuring it out. You know, it's right around the same time Christian Death was coming out as when 45 Grave was playing. So. Yep. I think they took a lot of influence from the L.A. hardcore punk scene where they mm -hmm. were really experimenting with different sounds. Like you had bands like Bad Brains who were, you know, combining reggae with hardcore punk or you know, bands who were trying to combine jazz and punk and, you know, country and punk and rockabilly and punk, like with mm -hmm. bands like X. And so I think that was a huge part of kind of hardcore punk in general. And so for Death Rock to have grown out of that scene, I think it is natural for them to kind of want to experiment with different things. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. So just kind of as a prerequisite before, I just want to kind of have a little discussion about the sound of it because 45 Grave is not your typical thing. Even their first album, well, Only Theater Pain, and I'm going to compare it to Only Theater Pain just to give people an idea because I think a little bit more people are familiar with that album as a whole. Mm -hmm. Only Theater Pain is a very specific sounding album you know the whole album sounds a specific way yeah whereas a 45 grave sleep and safety which is their first album is kind of all over the place you know it has a whole bunch of different sounds and so and they don't really have a lot of other albums to compare to yeah <laughs> and we'll get into that and everything but there's a lot of songs which is kind of interesting but it's two very different places like you know while we when we do like 
kind of the gothic rock bands, you know, there's a lot of overlap in the sounds a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, With death rock, especially in this case, two of the main death rock bands, they're totally different. Yeah, I will say one of the biggest differences that I find between them is that, yes, they both share the idea that they're very experimental and that they would change their sound as time went on. I see Christian Death as having more of like a the gradual trajectory as they, you know, evolved and changed sounds, whereas right from the get-go, it kind of feels like 45 Grave is trying different things and experimenting with their sound. Yeah, and that's something that we're going to see a lot of, actually, with their music. Yep. So let's just get right into it. So you want to talk about some history about 45 Grave? All right, yeah. So uh, basically, 45 Grave were founded in the year 1979 band was founded by Paul B. Cutler in Los Angeles during the punk rock movement, and he formed it alongside another band with the same lineup called Vox Pop, produced two singles, and the original lineup consisted of Dinah Cancer, formerly of the Castration Squad on vocals, Cutler, who was from the Consumers on guitar, Rob Pitter, who's also known as Rob Graves, who was from Bags and concurrently in the Gun Club on bass, and you had Don Bowles, who was associated with Germs and Nervous Gender on drums. So they definitely had a lineup that was this huge mix of goth and punk bands, basically. Yeah, and so it took them a little while to get going. So about, I think it was 1981, they started doing like single releases and a, a few different ones. And you can actually find quite a few of those singles if you live in the LA Orange County area. Yeah. Just because, you know, that's their that was their stomping ground. So there's not a ton of them out there. I will say that. Like they didn't have the greatest distribution or, you know, large amount of printing of some of these albums. Yep. So they had formed in it was say nineteen seventy nine. So they had done all these single releases and written actually a lot of material and even appeared on you know, I think it was um New Wave Theater. I think yeah. it might have been a little bit later. But inside nineteen eighty three they actually get a full length released yeah. and sleep and safety yep so it's her first studio album it's released on the record label enigma so you know, for once we have a band that's not on 4 ad yeah uh, i know so it's our beggar's banquet or yeah like <laughs> <laughs> yeah of course as soon as it's like death rock right yep yep but this is definitely uh it's you can't not say this is a pivotal album for them considering it's the album that everybody associates with them because it's their only album that was recorded with that lineup. Yeah. It's a very, very interesting album. And I actually really like it for a lot of reasons. And I think for what it was trying to do, it was pretty successful. And from what I've read, apparently the band wasn't the happiest with some of the versions of the songs on here. Yeah. Because there, a lot of the songs, like a lot of their most popular songs, have different versions of them recorded. Yeah. And from what I read, they weren't like super, super happy with the sound, but I think it actually sounds great. I think all the tracks are mixed really well. There are very rare instances on the album where I think things could have been EQ'd differently, but overall, I'm pretty happy with the way things are mixed, and I think it's a good representation of the band, and I, I just like this album, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, just starting right off you know, the intro, Insurance from God. It has this like hilarious tongue in cheek mentality throughout this whole album. This album was recorded by insurance agents. Or... This album was created by men who are successful career field agents in the life insurance business. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it starts out with an intro like that, and it has this cool like organ sound, and it changes tempos. Like the, actually, the first song is, is pretty cool in that it, it kind of does a whole bunch of different things at once. Like yeah, I, w- I was gonna bring up that that's probably one of my favorite songs from the album and it's an opener and i always dig it when you know the opening track really sets you up for an album yeah i will say the guitar solos on this album yeah that 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 was important to mention because i know that like a lot of the bands we do don't really have guitar solos yeah i will say that i I think a big part of that is because gothic rock grew out of post-punk which grew out of punk and punk traditionally didn't have a ton of solos whereas the la hardcore scene was more willing to experiment with that sort of thing and a lot of those Mm -hmm. bands incorporated guitar solos in their playing you know like bands like x had tons of guitar solos in their songs and i think death rock bands in general were more likely to include guitar solos maybe not as likely as 45 grave 
but I will say that's one thing that I did appreciate about 45 grade is that they would play guitar solo and who cares, you know, the, yep, <laughs> exactly. And then even getting into obviously some of their more popular songs. So evil, super awesome bass intro. Oh yeah. I absolutely love it. Evil's a great song. Really catchy too. <laughs> this is, this is one thing about some of the songs on this album are ridiculously catchy. And I, I think surf bad is like crazy catchy. Yeah. It's funny. Cause it's not, you know, it doesn't have any lyrics. It's, it's instrumental. I know, but it's just like this really cool, like dark sounding surf rock track. Yeah. Really reminds me of obviously like the Munsters. Yep. <laughs> so, but yeah, Surf Bat is totally cool. Of course, the most famous song on this album is Party Time. Yes. Party Time deserves its merit. It, it is yeah, a good song. It does. <laughs> it's, it's a good song. I'll say that, yeah, I, I think it's a good song. I think that there's some good stuff going on in it, especially on this album version, the single version, I think it's very, very 80s sounding. Yeah. Just because of the way that the chorus is, you know, it kind of sounds like the, you know, almost like a crowd is singing it in the chorus. Yeah. You know, do you want a party? <laughs> like, <laughs> And everyone's just yelling it. Yeah, that kind of stuff really reminds me of the kind of 80s over-the-topness of, like, anthems, you know? Yeah. I also like some like the naming of a lot of songs, like Dream Hits 2. Like, where's Dream Hits 1? <laughs> yeah. I think Dream Hits 1, because they actually have Dream Hits on the other albums. I think it's just the same song, if I remember correctly, <laughs> which I think it's probably kind of funny. <laughs> but, yeah, but there's also, if you get find other versions of it, sometimes it has, like, the... The other, the party time has a whole bunch of different versions. Like, yeah, there's a ton of recorded versions of party time. Yeah, there's different mixed versions. There's, there's a single version which has like more of an acoustic intro. It's a little more. I think that one sounds even more 80s, like more dynamic. And there's actually a version of party time. It's not on this album, but it is a more like punk version of it, where it doesn't have the chorus. You know, the party time. Yeah. It just has basically the intro and like the verses and like the breakdown and it's pretty much it. It yep. doesn't have like the catchy thing. It's pretty crazy. It's kind of weird considering I feel like the whole point of that song is party time. <laughs> I know, but yeah, you have um, songs like Violent World, which I love. I love that song so much. In fact, I love most of the songs on this album. I've it's really hard to kind of name a song that I didn't really like in fact i find that even though violent world has kind of more like a a 70s rock kind of sound and it even has um i think cutler is the one who's singing on that it's, it's not dina cancer singing on it yeah i still really like the sound of it it's really interesting it mixes a lot of different things and that's what i really really like about this album is you have songs that are super punk rock like this actual song 45 gray which i I think it's a great song, but they also include like keyboard parts and mix it with the guitar, so it has these really cool melodies. But then you have songs like Slice of Life, and then you have like Violent World, and you have a catchy one like Party Time, and then you have songs like Evil, and it's just so interesting. Yeah, I will say I, I'm kind of with you on the whole. There's not really a song that I genuinely hate on this album, which is kind of rare when we're doing these reviews. Like usually yeah. there's one song that I really don't want to listen to, mm -hmm. but. It, I honestly, I I could listen to this album, you know, just through and through, and would never really feel the need to hit skip. And of course, um, you have riboflavin flavored, non-carbonated, polyunsaturated blood. I think on the on the album they just call it riboflavin. But I also want to note that this was not on the original LP; it was added for like subsequent yeah. versions of it. But it's really good because it has like the kind of cheesy, almost like Adam's Family kind of like. Yeah, what, what's it called? Like like novelty song kind of organ, you know? Like, ooh, it's it's Halloween and everything. And it has that sort of sound to it. It's really, really cool. And I really, really like this song. But this version's only on, like, CDs and things like that for this one. Yeah, no, I have to agree with you. That's definitely a really good song that I kind of wish was included on the original LP. Mm -hmm. Because if I ever come across this LP at a semi-reasonable price, I'm definitely going to snatch it. I already got... You know, my school's out single guy that's probably as best as I'll ever get <laughs> with collecting yeah. 45 grave. <laughs> Actually, it's funny. I think that the CD version also adds that single on there. School's out. Yep. It's pretty good. Actually, you're re recording it. I like it. Yeah, it's uh, it's not a bad cover at all. I usually hesitant 
to listen to covers just because bands often they either do this thing where they just play the song exactly like it sounds or they make it so genuinely like different that's unrecognizable it's the original track and it's like why didn't you just write a new song yeah and i feel like it, it's cool when bands find like a balance between paying homage to the original song while putting their own spin on it i think we've had the discussion a whole bunch of times about some other band but i can't remember oh i think it was rosetta stone <laughs> yes <laughs> because <laughs> they, they uh they, and album covers yeah and we weren't very fond of them no uh, that album i mean i like rosetta stone but yes, yeah that, that album <laughs> so yeah um as far as actually listening to this album it's kind of tough i'm gonna be honest now i mean getting your hands on a physical copy of it can be kind of tough spotify has it if you're i don't know if if it's locked out for countries, like specific countries. It's on YouTube. They have like the good quality version of it on it's, YouTube? It's pretty good quality. Huh. Okay. Well, there you go too. But yeah, Spotify has it, but Spotify has a really strange version of it. It adds like a whole bunch of like little bonus tracks and everything like that. Um, it doesn't have like the original LP listening, which is usually what we're talking about when we review albums. Yeah. Um, but the one on YouTube is almost the exact same as the original LP. They just add the schools out and the party time single version. Okay. So that's a way to listen to it. I didn't actually know about, but. Oh, and it also has uh Rival Flavin. Okay. Yeah. So it also has Rival Flavin too. But the thing that you're going to want to be aware of, if you're trying to collect 45 Graves music is a lot of the older stuff is pretty hard to come by. And I can very honestly say that <laughs> because it's tough for us to find music from them like actual physical copies of it whether it's vinyl yep. records or cds or cassettes or anything like that and it seems like most of the time whenever somebody has it they're pretty aware of what they have mm-hmm. and so sleep and safety i know goes for well over 40 dollars usually on vinyl it goes for 20 to 30 on cd it can go for a ton on cassette and a lot of their singles before that also go for a lot. So if you're trying to collect the old catalog of 45 Grave Things, you know, mostly before anything like that's before their live album, is yeah. that 1989, it's going to be kind of hard to find. And I just wanted to let people know that just in case they were trying to, you know, want to go in their music store, you know, where if they still physically buy music. Yeah. Like, oh, do you have any 45 Grave stuff? They might have their newer stuff, but any yeah, of the like, older stuff, it's just hard to come by. You're likely to come across Pick Your Poison, but uh, you're going to have a hard time finding other stuff. Yeah. I have run into only the Good Die Young, but that's because they have a whole bunch of different like pressings of it. Yeah. Not a ton, but they have like alternate pressings of it. So that's Sleep and Safety. I think this is actually a really good, unique album. And yeah, it's hard to lump it into a category. You know, Of course, people are going to lump this in Death Rock because it's seen as one of those pioneering death rock albums yep and it's funny because i think a lot of what they were doing could have been definitely grouped into horror punk you know i really think that and i know i might get some flack or something for it but i I genuinely feel that way i don't think that you will get as much flack as you think for that only because there was a lot of critics at the time who kind of not at the time but at the time that horror punk came out who described you know, 45 Grave as being the influence for a lot of horror punk bands and being kind of the progenitors of that sound. Yeah. I definitely think that, you know, 45 Grave falls more within the death rock category, but, you know, I I could definitely see where that influence would play a big role in horror punk and its involvement and its evolution. And I just kind of want to briefly mention that uh, I thought it was cool that this album is actually pretty well received by critics Whereas compared to a lot of other death rock bands who were kind of attacked by critics for mm-hmm. calling them, you know, droning and boring. A lot of critics like this album. They said that, you know, this contained like most of 45 Graves best songs and they often compared it to only theater of pain. And so they would, <laughs> they would frequently comment on the fact that they enjoyed that this album they felt took more risks than only theater of pain. Yeah. That's the thing about, only theater. Didn't we talk about that when it, we actually did an episode of how a lot of critics actually thought this was like Only Theater Pain was unlistenable or something? Yep. Has, I think there was some review like that. But but yeah, I actually think that this is a very well 
made album, which is kind of crazy for not only punk rock, but like death rock. You know, a lot of those albums are very just extremely reverb heavy and, you know, they're kind of relying on mood more than, say, like recording quality. Yep. But this album is actually really well done. I think that's why I enjoy this album a lot is because I will say that that tends to be a thing that bothers me when I'm listening to death rock. There's a lot of death rock bands that I like, but sometimes the mixing can be kind of annoying. can yeah, sound well, very much like hardcore punk bands record in terms of mixing. Oh, I think it usually sounds like a punk album with a lot more reverb yeah. <laughs> most of the time. And there's nothing against that. You know, it's a very unique sound a lot of time. But with this album, you know, a lot of the stuff, it actually has a pretty good punch to it. And while there is a lot of effects on, like, say, the vocals or, you know, trying to give things a little bit of a kind of creepy tone, it's not, like, a muddy sounding at all. I don't think, I think you can very distinctly hear what they were doing. And this doesn't have that kind of muddy sound that we talk about. And, if, and that's pretty unique. I, I really, really like the sound of it. And I, think it's actually a great album for like you know like a party it's a great kind of spooky party it's perfect album. for party time it's perfect for party time yeah <laughs> just because it has that sort of like camp element too to it and i just i really like it plus the album cover uh, is awesome i was just gonna say that i was like and even the album cover is great oh <laughs> uh, yeah cool all right yeah, yeah. the album cover is so cool i love it yeah it's like it, this creepy shadow yep person on the bed it's great <laughs> yeah so I really recommend Sleep and Safety because, you know, this is an album that I think is really accessible, actually, to people who listen to punk, people who listen to horror punk, people who listen to death rock, people who like campy sort of music, people who like to dance. I mean, it just has so many things about it that I think are really good. Yeah. The first time I really sat down and listened to it, I was surprised by how much I liked. And plus the song 45 Grave, it's just worth it because it's so amazing. (laughs) <laughs> I I definitely agree with that. And I will say I think most of their hits are hits because they're they deserve that. Yeah. We love Sleep and Safety. Go listen to it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is our newly renamed it's called Recent Interesting Goth Stuff. It's Riggs for short, R-I-G-S, but we're probably just going to call it Recent Interesting Goth Stuff. So I finally renamed it from the new segment because most of the time it's just me talking about DVDs mm, yeah. and stuff that we find in the news. But this one is kind of a recent news story, so it's kind of funny that we actually renamed it. And then really the main news story that we have for this week is some Sandman news. So anybody who's familiar with Neil Gaiman's Sandman, which is the graphic novel series, and it's, it's great. I love it. And it's a it's amazing. Neil Gaiman himself is so amazing. Yeah, he uh, he definitely provides comics that are very witty, very intellectual, but definitely have that dark appeal to them. I, I think that most people in the Gothic community, if they don't you know read his comics or aren't familiar with him, certainly would appreciate them. Yeah, well, he also has books and all this different stuff. I think he even wrote Coraline, which is kind of crazy. So. Uh, at least the original book for Coraline. But New Line has been trying to make a movie for this for a while. I think they have the rights for it. So Neil has actually tried to get this movie made for a long time. And he says, you know, I don't want to make it if it's not right, you know. And it's been in development hell for years. I think that the rights to Sandman for a movie was bought, you know, well over a decade ago, if I if I think correctly. So, but one of the people who was on or going to be in the movie was going to be Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And he's probably going to play Dream. So interesting yeah right so they just announced uh, as at the time of recording this very recently that he's off the movie and he did this whole thing so neil of course put out things saying you know i have all this respect for joseph and like i hope we get to work together and all stuff at some other point but i like what joseph gordon levitt wrote about this and i'm not like the biggest fan of joseph gordon levitt if anybody's wondering i just i thought this was kind of cool that he um said this and so he said A few months ago, I came to realize that the folks at New Line and I just don't see eye to eye on what makes Sandman special, what a film adaptation could and should be. So unfortunately, I've decided to move myself from the project. I wish nothing but the best for the team moving forward. And so it just is kind of interesting. But then Gaiman also came out with another thing where he said, Reminder for the curious, I don't own Sandman. DC Comics does. 
I don't choose who writes scripts, the director, producer, or the cast. For me, what's important is the 2,500 pages of Sandman, not a movie that may or may not ever happen. Yeah. And so I think that that's two very real looks at how these movie adaptations of things we love actually come to be. Yep. Is, you know, we, of course, expect, you know, Neil to be there, you know, filming it and kind of setting up everything and doing Standing costumes. behind Joseph Gordon-Levitt and be like, you're not doing that take right. Yeah, you know, you're not dream enough. And so, <laughs> but I'm sure that, like, you know, the the even the rights were probably bought before, you know, any of these kind of comic book movies were even good anyway. You know, I mean, you remember how bad yep. they used to be. But I actually have a lot of respect that Joseph Gordon-Levitt, you know, even though he loves Sandman, he's like, you know, this isn't what it is. And, like, you're turning it into something that's probably, like, a summer blockbuster or something. Like, yeah. You know, I mean, think about it. The first part of Sam, if anybody's ever read it, I mean, it's amazing. But, yeah. you know, you don't even see Dream for a lot of that of that first book, you know? like Yeah. And, uh, you know, he and he's really weak and all, all this stuff. You know, it's a very, very interesting story. And, yeah, I'm sure it would be hard to put it into a film, but I would love to see it almost exactly put into a film, you know, just to... Because I, I love Sandman so much, but I think it's kind of sad that we won't see a movie. But yeah, I agree with Joseph Gordon Levin. If it's not going to be what the story is or what it represents or what makes it special, then what's the point of even doing it? <laughs> yeah, I will say that's one thing that I've really always respected about Joseph Gordon Levin. He's either for you or he isn't. Like, I don't find a lot of people who are just eh about Joseph Gordon Levin. People usually have pretty strong opinions about him, either pro or against. But what I will say is that he does have a lot of artistic integrity. I don't feel like he works on a lot of projects that are just out there for fluff usually. And like, he's a very devoted actor and you know, whether or not you like his acting style is a whole nother discussion, but yeah, I respect him for having, you know, the ability to say that he doesn't like where this project is going. And so he doesn't want to be involved with it. Yeah. So that's that. Maybe one day Sandman will come out and, astound us all and then everyone will be like oh my gosh I've loved it forever and you'll be like no I was into it way before you were and then everyone can have an argument about who's more of an elitist or we could film our own version of Sandman put it out get sued and become super famous that's a good idea yeah huh <laughs> that's a really good idea I like that <laughs> um <laughs> just the two of us like we're every character <laughs> yep <laughs> um that would actually be really funny <laughs> oh, we're going to work on that. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and then I also just want to say one other thing um, is that I actually saw Deadpool this last week. I saw it as well. Yeah, so good, right? Deadpool was very, very good. They did a perfect job at really kind of portraying what Deadpool is and what he means to the fans and how he behaves in comics and, you know, video games. And it's just excellent use of fourth wall breaks and you know, poking fun on themselves. And I remember when this movie came out, I was worried that Ryan Reynolds was cast in it because I'll I'll be honest, I'm not like a huge Ryan Reynolds fan. It's not like a lot of movies he's been in that I could say that I really like. But when the trailers came out for this, I could immediately tell that they had done a good job in casting him for this and that his style of humor really lends itself to this character. And he's more than willing to poke fun at himself. Like, in fact, there's a joke about how uh, you know, someone says looks aren't everything, and he responds by saying, are you kidding me? Do you think Ryan Reynolds got this far in his acting chops? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, man, there's just so many things that were just, yeah, just right on the head for this. And it's kind of crazy because years ago, I used to actually read quite a bit of comics. I'm not really into comic books as much as I used to be. In fact, the most stuff I read is, like, kind of older, you know, that, uh, yeah. you know, quite a quite a few years old because I find like I don't know the whole superhero thing is so obviously done now with all the movies and everything but yeah I had read you know years ago the original Deadpool story and you know it was like I think it was like four or five issues and it was you know very gritty very dark but it also had this very kind of sarcastic thing to it. it wasn't as you know as insane as obviously it is now yeah where literally like he's barely in a comic book like he just like breaks the fourth wall every single second but yep. it's it's crazy because they just they really did nail that sort of like 
dark humor and like there's so many jokes like it's definitely the funniest out of any of those movies and maybe it's just because i have a kind of twisted sense of humor but like they really i think nailed it it was, it's great like it's i love it great to see a lot of jokes that he breaks the fourth wall constantly within the movie but the script itself breaks the fourth wall and that they reference things that are concurrently going on in reality <laughs> The fact that they'll talk about the studio's budget for the film inside yeah. the movie. <laughs> yeah, he's like, because there's only two X Men in the film ever. Yeah. And he shows up to the X Men mansion and he's like, he's like, you know, it's such a big house. He's like, but I only ever see the two of you. He's like, it's almost like they didn't have enough money to get more X Men in the movie. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, it's, it's just that stuff is so funny. And uh, the opening credits are great too, the way they. They credit people like uh, produced by Assats and uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> directed by like overpaid something. And yeah. <laughs> then you, you see the writer's tag because this is clearly the writer's work and doing most of this. It's like <laughs> the writer's uh, little caption is uh, the real heroes. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, um, I really recommend it. Of course, it's. Not a movie to take kids to. In fact, all these parents are mad that they made a superhero that's rated R and all stuff. But they they captured what that character's about. You know, he's like he's a very <laughs> horny, loud mouth, sarcastic, violent character. Yep. And uh they they got it. So if anybody's has had a question, I mean it's already made like three hundred million dollars at the box office or something like that. So oh, yeah. if you had any other questions, then go see it. Oh yeah, by the way, because technically Deadpool is the one who started the whole wait till the end of the credits to see if there's a clip at the end of the movie. That does happen in this film. Yeah. <laughs> and I like the way they did it. Uh, yeah. He I just did. kind of he looks at the camera and his, he's in a bathrobe and he's like, why are you still here? He, he really expecting that whole end of the movie <laughs> yep. clip to happen? Mm-hmm. He's like, J- just go home. He's like, of course there's going to be another movie. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know who's going to be in it. <laughs> you know? Yep. So, yeah, it's hilarious. And I, I fully recommend it. I haven't laughed that hard in a long time. In fact, if most people know me. I don't really laugh that much at all anyway. <laughs> so the fact that I was actually laughing at something, like, it must have been really screwed up. Yep. So I recommend Deadpool. But, yeah, the... Sandman, of course, gets delayed again. I just thought it was interesting because it was, you know, obviously a big name star was attached to it at some point. Now, of course, they're not attached again. So, Joseph Gordon Levin's not on Sandman. So, Sandman basically has no star yet again. Yep. And uh, go see Deadpool. Yep. All right. That's uh, recent, interesting goth stuff. And some of it's not always goth. <laughs> some is not always. Yeah, I guess Deadpool's not really got. Well, you, the recent. It's interesting, dark. Yeah, it's dark. <laughs> Alright, so that's it. Okay, so you know how we normally only talk about the main albums for a band, you know, maybe like live albums. We don't really talk about EPs unless it's super necessary or compilations. Although we, we did it with Joy Division, obviously, for reasons we explained. Yeah. And for 45 Grave, we're doing that too. We're going to talk about the album Autopsy. And it's a compilation album. Yeah, it's released after they broke up because they broke up in 1985, just two years after their debut album. Yeah, and so what this does, it basically compiles like alternate versions of songs and songs that weren't really available to anybody besides listening to singles or different releases that they had done. Yeah. It basically compiles a lot of that onto one album. And I think it's great. I think it's a great piece of history for them and I think it actually has a lot of really good songs yeah no I definitely agree you know there's a ton of material on this that didn't make you know the original album that I think could have been included at least like as an EP or something and so I'm glad that these songs made it to something and they made it to a compilation album and yeah I'm not as big a fan of compilation albums as maybe other people are but I like that this is out there and this exists because there's not a lot of material to go off of when it comes to 45 grave and that's not to say that they didn't record that much i mean they might not have recorded as much as other bands but because you know there's a lot of controversy around their you know breakup and i'm sure there was legal issues and things regarding that it's just very hard to find any music by them and so i'm glad that this album exists and that 
you know, we get to see more of their material because I really enjoyed their first album and that kind of sound that they had. And so to have an album that, you know, just gives me some more of that material that was recorded that might not have been released is, I think, a great thing. Yeah. And of course, because this is a compilation album, it doesn't have the same kind of sound or the same kind of cohesiveness that Sleep and Safety had, obviously. Yeah. Because it's pulling from a whole bunch of different times that things were recorded and, you know, everything like that. It wasn't kind of made all at once or in the same way. So you have a number of songs that weren't released anywhere else. So you have like I, My Type, Consumers, Consumer yep. Citizen, things like that. But then you also have alternate versions of songs that were on Sleep and Safety. And those are like Party Time, Surf Bat, Dream Hits. And they're actually kind of a little rough around the edges. And they kind of have a, a grittier type of sound to them. Yeah. I'll say I'm not really the biggest fan of those versions necessarily. Like, you know, I'm not a bigger fan of these versions as opposed to Sleep and Safety. Mostly because I just feel like the energy is a l- little lacking on some of the versions here. Like riboflavin flavored, non-carbonated, polyunsaturated blood. Yep. I was going to say that. <laughs> it's a great track name. Yeah. This version on Autopsy, I feel like isn't as good as the one that's featured on the Sleep and Safety when it was re-released. Yeah. And it just kind of lacks something. No, I, I definitely agree with you. And this is where I usually find that I have some, uh, I don't know, some disappointment with compilation albums simply because usually the alternate versions of songs aren't as good and it's not always the case sometimes alternate versions are better but usually i kind of want to hear the original versions of songs if they were done well and in this band's case i think a lot of these songs were done very well the first time around so yeah. i, I kind of would have liked to see a compilation that incorporated you know some just original mixes from the original album maybe alongside additional mixes and then, you know, unreleased songs. I think that would have been a cool way to do it. But, you yeah. know, it yeah. is what it is. And I'm glad this album still exists, at least. Yeah. I will say this. The version of Dream Hits and Surf Bad are actually pretty good. Like, And I love the song I. Like, I totally think that, like, just for those songs, it, sh- it should be worth it. But also, I'm really happy that they included Wax and Black Cross. Yeah. Because, like I said, those on vinyl or like any other release is pretty hard to find. Yes. So the fact that they included it on autopsy is very, very helpful. Yeah, no. And that's completely why I think that uh, compilation albums do us some good these days, particularly for vinyl, because it's going to be impossible to come across those singles. And this gives us a chance to potentially listen to that music or, you know, find it in a different medium. Yeah. Just for those, those two songs, it was like, you know, one of the little one of the little 45s. It was, I think it was like $50 or like 50 or $60 just for that yeah. for 45 grade. Because that, you just don't, it's funny because there's two stores in Orange County that we usually go to. I think both of them have a copy of it and they're both like 50, 60 bucks. Yep. So I'm really glad that it exists on Autopsy. So we can listen to Wax and Black Cross without trying to find some crummy version that's on YouTube that doesn't sound very good, you know? Yep. Um, if it's on another album, usually it's going to be pretty good quality. And yeah, these recordings, while the quality and like the mixing is all over the place, because you know they're not obviously done at the same time, they're still all really good. I think that the most important thing about this band is that they try different things, they get the energy across, and that's like what makes them great. And I think that Autopsy is a perfect example of that working still. And I I really recommend this album actually. Yeah, you know? I definitely agree with everything you have to say on that. Hey, you better. Uh huh. So yeah, that's Autopsy. It's great, but I still recommend Sleep and Safety more. I think that's the bottom line. This is a good little uh, hidden gem to perhaps pick up some songs that you wouldn't hear on their debut album, but I would still recommend Sleep and Safety over this. Yeah. All right, so the album we're going to be talking about next is from 1989, and it's called Only the Good Die Young. This is a live album. And I'm going to let Robert describe some of the behind the scenes that went on in between, you know, their first album and Autopsy and this album. Yeah. So basically what had happened is they'd been around since 1979 and they broke up by the time 1985 came around. So they were really kind of a short lived band. However, in 1988, they reformed for a brief tour 
And during that tour, they recorded the album Only the Good Die Young, which is their live album that we're going to be reviewing. Mm -hmm. However, after that tour, Ritter died in 1990 from a drug overdose. And so the band broke up again after that, and they remained inactive for years and years, basically until their next studio album, which was... We'll get to that. It was only released four years ago, but we're, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Only the Good Day Young is the live album that we're, we're talking about. And again, it's a pretty interesting album. Like, 45 Grave definitely had a very strange way of doing things because you had a lot of, you had a few single releases, and then you have Sleep and Safety. And then you have Autopsy, which is a compilation of all some other songs, and then, you know, the EPs and alternate versions of songs of Sleep and Safety. So you get like a little more material, right? Mm-hmm. And then this album comes out, which is a live album, and has songs that are still unreleased. So you're getting the songs from Autopsy and Sleep and Safety, but then you have even more new songs. So it's be kind of weird to figure out where all the songs came from. It's kind of yeah, all over the place. It's it's very hard to place where a lot of these songs come from. You know, they potentially could have written songs while they were on tour. A lot of bands do that. Maybe they kind of remained in contact during the time they were broken up. Maybe they had a few rehearsals. Ultimately, we don't really know. There's not a ton that's published about 45 Grave, unfortunately. And so we basically just have the information that, you know, it's floating out there on the web and from, you know, CD booklets and what have you. Yeah, anyway, writing interviews or articles or anything like that. So we tried to pull what we could, but... It's kind of hard to place how their sound evolved whenever you can't really place exactly when some of these songs came out yeah. <laughs> or when they were written. So we kind of have a little bit of the material that's still kind of similar to what they were doing. I would say that most of their stuff can kind of be grouped into one giant kind of sound and that it's sort of punk, but it's all over the place. Yeah. You know? But then for this live album, even the new songs that we get here, they're still similar to what they were doing. Yep. I just want to say that. You know, they're not going like all the new songs that are on this album aren't like off the deep end of what they were already doing. Because, I mean, it would be pretty hard for them to go way off bat with what they started with. Yeah, they were already a band that was very experimental and th- that was kind of the 45 Grave sound. So I don't feel like there was a huge departure from their sound. Um, mm-hmm. This is a band that tries a lot of different things, but I feel like ultimately always has the 45 Grave stamp on it, whereas maybe a band like Christian Death has this very gradual evolution where their sound changes dramatically. Yeah, exactly. And this album, Only Good Day Young, you know, I actually, I like it. You know, I think for a live album, it really shows off where, obviously, they're very punk influenced. I think that that energy really comes across on this album. And maybe some of the songs on Sleep in Safety might not have had the most punk undertone to them. Yeah. The album really asserts that. That, like, yeah, live, this was a punk band. Yeah, Sleep and Safety is definitely, it's a goth record. Like, you know, as much as it is influenced by punk and a bunch of different things, it's very much goth oriented and very death rock. But I do feel like when they play live, because, you know, they, they're very much into the, you know, playing fast and loud. Those punk undertones really shine through. And I think sometimes people just tend to be like, oh, that's a punk band. Like if, if they'd never seen them before, hadn't heard them before. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. Now, the mixing on this album is kind of like a punk live album. In fact, it's kind of all over the place. Yeah. But that's perfectly fine with me, honestly. I think that the energy is... And the entertainment in, you know, these live albums is what's most important, you know, other than just nailing the songs. Yeah. And I really actually like the renditions of a lot of these songs on this album, you know. I think Dream Hits, it's a great version. In fact, it might be my favorite version of that song that exists. And Party Time, it has lost its kind of 80s-ness with (laughs) this version. It kind of goes back to being a little more aggressive. Party Time definitely benefits from being mixed in a more aggressive way. And so I tend to enjoy, like, this rendition and, you know, other particular releases of that song where it sounds a little more aggressive and is less less campy. I do like this album. I actually, I do recommend it. There are alternate versions of songs that would actually appear on later albums. Like, actually, you have Akira 
and it's called Akira Rydine on this one. Yeah. And then you also have Sorceress, which is on this, and it would be on a later album, much later. Yep. So you actually can get a look at what they were going to do later and compare it to their next album. But I think if you want a recommendation on this one, I would say if you're a big fan of Sleep and Safety and you think that that's the definitive way that 45 Graves should sound and you wouldn't want them any heavier, probably don't listen to this album. Yeah. <laughs> But if you're looking for something that's a little more aggressive by them, you know, they take versions of those same songs and make them a little more, you know, uh, gritty. <laughs> yeah. This is what you want. And I like kind of Dinah's, you know, when she's talking to the audience and everything, I just really, really like it. And the guitar work and, you know, sometimes they go off rhythm a little bit, you know, it doesn't really matter. And you can tell that they're just having kind of fun and getting into it. Yeah. Uh, I'll say this. I do enjoy this album. Maybe perhaps not as much as you do. I think it's a good album. However, I think I, this would have done better as a DVD for me because I I think what would have really drawn me in for this album is, is to really feel like I'm there. And I don't know. I'm not the biggest fan of live albums. Bigger fan of live DVDs and live VHSs and things like that. I, mm-hmm. I, I like seeing the video along with a live audio recording. It just kind of helps yeah. me feel there. But if you're a huge fan of 45 Grave, I would definitely say take a listen to this. It's definitely worth listening to. I still prefer the original versions of these songs, but I think that these are worth listening to, and I definitely still enjoyed the album. Maybe not as much as Sleep and Safety, but still a really good album. I recommend it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so now we're going to jump quite a number of years into the future. So, like Robert said, they had broken up. I think it was 1990 or 1989. And 1990. 1990. And they pretty much went silent. I mean, there wasn't really anything coming out about 45 Grave. And, yeah. you know, there wasn't a ton of repressing of CDs. There wasn't, like, the best of 45 Grave. You know, there wasn't all the stuff came out and I don't know if there was any kind of legal stuff about that or any of the record you know I don't know I don't know anything about like record labels or anything with them of of what had happened during that time and so they kind of went silent and then I think it was around 2004 they started getting rumblings of you know trying to reform and everything and so sure enough we had a reform 45 grave in about 2005 and there was some growing pains they didn't really kind of get back on the horse right away but yeah. over the years, you know, there's kind of hints about maybe some new music. And sure enough, in 2012, we got Pick Your Poison. And yeah. there's some p- pretty interesting things about the members here, too. We also have on guitar, it's basically a whole new lineup, you know, that's is Dinah Cancer and then a whole new lineup of people. Yeah, so they pretty much found the lineup by 2010. Album got released in 2012. An uh, interesting thing to note was is that Frank Agnew of TSOL, Social Distortion, and the Adolescents, who is also Rick Agnew's brother, joined the band. Um, yeah, and, and it, just in case you don't remember our Christian Death episode, Rick Agnew is, of course, the guitarist who played on Only Theater of Pain. Yep, and he was also involved in different versions of a 45 Graves lineup. Like, in particular, their, uh, I believe he played in their 2004 Reformation. Huh, I didn't know that. But... Pick Your Poison is a very interesting album. So it's technically like, the, I think it's just a, if we're including the live album, you know, from 1989, it'd be, what is it, 23 years since yeah, since a new album. So you're going to expect some, some differences, right? And I don't feel that this album relies on nostalgia. I really don't. And I know that a lot of bands may try to bank on that and they may have really similar sounds to what they'd already done, but a little less well done. <laughs> yeah. But I don't feel that this album was trying to do that. I feel like this album was trying to just get a point across, get a good album out. And it has some missteps. I'm not going to lie. You know, while I do love 45 Grave, there are some issues with this album and a little bit more than their earlier material, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So, again, we have some songs we've already seen before, like Sorceress and Akira, like you mentioned. Yeah, um, and actually a, short, a way shorter version of Akira, and it pretty much just slims it down, I think. <laughs> yeah. I will say what they do well on this album is they still keep that spirit of campiness alive that was always present 
in their music. You have songs like Highway 666 or Lucky 214. Mm-hmm. Night of the Demons. Yep. <laughs> Pick Your Poison. You know, yeah. They're definitely keeping the spirit of 45 Grave alive. However, I will say I don't feel like the songwriting is as strong on this album. Yeah, uh, I would I would agree with that. Now, one of the things that uh, you know I said when we we're talking about sleep safety is it's pretty easy to see where their influences were were coming from on pretty much every single song that they do. You can kind of tell where the influences are coming from to some extent. With this album, I feel that's true too. You know, you can definitely feel a lot of influences, but they're very different influences. Yeah. So I feel that this album draws a lot more from like. 70s and 80s classic rock and by classic rock i mean kind of like chunky guitar sounds that are not like super distorted you know they're kind of like almost like bluesy rock kind of guitars if that makes sense yeah Uh, at least in terms of the tone kind of like social distortion i mean i don't know if frank agnew did that on purpose but it kind of reminds me of that sort of chunky punk kind of sound but you in terms of the vocals and the songwriting yeah a lot of it is a little more straightforward and as a result I feel a little bit more bland unfortunately I really hate to say that because there's some good parts in this album but it doesn't have the consistency that um, even even Autopsy had you know I, st- I still really like a lot of the songs in Autopsy even if you take out the songs from Sleep and Safety yeah uh, here I just find some of the songs like you know I just don't really connect with them as well and they don't kind of bring me up as much as some of the older material does, but there's still a lot of really good material. Yeah, I'll say, I think a big part of my problem with this album is the way it's mixed. It's mixed in a very kind of generic, sterile kind of way. And like I understand using modern recording equipments and things have changed a lot since the 80s in terms of recording. So obviously, like it, it's kind of impossible to get an album that sounds exactly just the same or like has the exact same vibe as you would have had that many years ago especially with a new band and that much time apart mm-hmm. but this album uh, i just i feel like their producer could have done a better job of maybe steering them in the right direction and maybe could have recorded them with a little more energy a lot of these tracks feel very kind of dry and very studio produced and I don't know. It just kind of loses some of the magic for me on them. Yeah, I I really, really agree with that, <laughs> unfortunately. Like I said, yeah, the, the mixing is, I think, what is the biggest deal for me. Yep. And the guitar tone, too. I, those are probably the two biggest things. Now, I think the songwriting, even for the songs like, say, Night of the Demons, I think it's... A pretty good song you know it's got a very gutty kind of guitar sound yeah but the vocals are super clean they're pushed super far into the mix and it doesn't really have that kind of aggression and this album really really lacks a kind of like grittiness to it it while there are good moments and there's like you know big bombastic kind of drums and everything like that on it you know they're very in your face and everything but i just feel like the aggression and the spontaneous energy that was on the other ones is kind of lost a little bit in this. And it does have a very, very clean sound. And I think if they maybe added some reverb and kind of scaled back a little bit of, you know, the kind of production, I don't know, like may, maybe something just needs to be adjusted. I don't, it's hard to say, but it's, a, it's just a I, very modern sounding album. And I don't think that lends itself to 45 grave. Yeah, I agree. I just I just want the guitar to be more started. I think it would really help. I really think it would have helped a lot of this, but unfortunately, when you're listening to a lot of this stuff, it just has that. I mean, Akira, which obviously has the version on Only the Good Die Young, I think that version on the live album is way better than this version because I swear with the way that this is mixed on the album, it sounds like Kansas's Carry On My Wayward Son. <laughs> Like the 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 way it's mixed and the way the guitar sounds and stuff, yeah. And I'm not I'm really not trying to be like insulting. I really am not. Like I think it's a good song. Like in fact, I really loved it on Only Good That Young. But the way it's produced here, it sounds kind of funky to me. Like I'm I'm not gonna lie. And that's my one problem with the parts that are supposed to be really heavy is that it comes off kind of lackluster because of that. Yeah, the, the heavier material in this album comes off feeling less aggressive because it just kind of has this very 80s hard rock stamp on it instead of really feeling like something that's 
more pushed by punk or metal or something that's genuinely more aggressive in nature Mm -hmm. and i think that kind of boils down to the mixing like the the guitars are very 80s kind of guitars very mid heavy yeah you know i i I complain when there's no mids in guitars but there is a there's such thing as having too much too mid (laughs) yep (laughs) yeah this is just kind of the consistent issue that I would have with it. Now, well, I'm going to talk about something else so you know, it doesn't feel like we're just bashing on this album because I think that there's some good stuff on here. But I do want to say that Johnny is basically a country song. Yeah, but, I mean, they have roots with, like, the Gun Club who are, you know, kind of a progenitors of Gothabilly and Cowpunk and other things that would come along. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> so... <laughs> But you have a lot of good stuff on here. So you have the song Child of Fear, which I, is an awesome song. I love that yeah. song. I love the harp intro. It kind of has like a little Celtic influence mm-hmm. in there. I It's kind of like an epic. I mean, it's I really like that song. You know, Night of the Demons, other than it's missing, I think it's a good song. And even Pick Your Poison, it kind of has, a, again, the classic rock kind of feel. But, it's you know, it's okay. But I do like when they try different things like, like Lucky 214, which ends with this kind of like ska horns in it. Yeah. Like, it's super weird, but I, I really enjoy it. And, you know, A Desert Dream, which is, again, an instrumental. It has this really cool, like, piano and guitar thing. It's kind of kind of cool. It's, like, a little bit experimental. And I, I really like that kind of stuff. You know, they're trying different things on this album. And I, I really like that. But, you know, the meat of, you know, the songs that are trying to be aggressive and everything, I just don't feel it hits as well as it should. And that's that's my opinion. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I do think that they have the potential to release some more good material. We went and saw them live, and you know, although they had some technical issues, I thought they put on a really good performance. And so I'd kind of like to see some more material released from them because you know, it's, it's their first go round after you know, basically close to 30 years mm-hmm. of being relatively inactive. And so, you know your first time back might not be great but i i still think that they're capable of doing some good things and it, i think it'd be cool if we saw a resurgence of 45 grave yeah i think that this album it has some good stuff on it but it's just not as memorable unfortunately that's that's really what i can say about it it's not that album it's not the greatest album it's okay some good stuff on it some good songs some stuff i really like on it but some of the stuff just kind of generic and i didn't really feel that way about the first album and even Autopsy and, yeah. and, you know, the live album must still kept my attention, even though it was the same songs. And, yeah, so I think if they can make a album that's a little more aggressive next time or yeah. maybe just mixed and produced in a different way, then I would be all in for it. And I think this album, even with these songs, could have been done, you know, better. They probably did it the way they wanted to. I can say that. If, if, you did the, uh, if they did it the way they wanted to, that's all that matters. Yeah. But... That's just my opinion. I would definitely agree with that. Okay. So that's Pick Your Poison. Uh, kind of a weird note to end on, <laughs> unfortunately. But it's, you know, it's the most recent music. And if they do new music, I'll be looking forward to it. You know, they were really good live. And, yeah, they had some pretty pretty bad technical difficulties when we saw them. In fact, I think like three amps got blown up. And we heard basically party time with just bass, drums, and vocals. <laughs> Yeah. So, 45 Grave is pretty awesome. I really recommend their 80s material, and I even recommend some of the stuff on Pick Your Poison. Mostly Child of Fear. I really like Desert Dream. Lucky 214 is not bad either, but I just don't recommend it as wholeheartedly as their earlier stuff. Yeah, I'll, I recommend Pick Your Poison with a disclaimer. I, like, don't go into it expecting it to be the old 45 Grave but if you're open to them sounding different or maybe being a little different and knowing that they're not the same band because they, they aren't, you know, it's a new lineup. Yeah. Maybe you'll find some things on there that you like. Do I think it's as good as their old material? I'll be honest. No. Oh, you know, it, it doesn't make it an atrocious album. No, just, that's what I was saying. Yeah. But yeah, I, I would definitely recommend their eighties material over it and sleep and safety still, Brain supreme for me. Yeah, it's 45 Grave. Looking forward to some new stuff from them. If you haven't seen them, go see them. I mean, they're honestly a pretty energetic live show, and they still got it. I think Dinah Cancer still has it um, yeah. in her voice. But I would really like some new music. I'll just say that. 
So I would agree. Yeah. So I'm Dr. Sanders. This is Robbie Gore. And this has been Gothcast episode 24. And of course, Gothcast is brought to you in part by The Belfry. Yeah, so The Belfry is a network of podcasts. It caters to the gothic community. So you're going to find lots of podcasts that either talk about gothic subculture or gothic music or you'll have podcasts that play gothic music they also are affiliated with youtube channels and just various forms of distribution and promotion it's a great place to find things if you're interested in the gothic community and the gothic subculture whether you're coming to it for the first time or you're a seasoned veteran i think you'll definitely find something on their website and you can go ahead and give them that url to our Yes, yeah, so you're going to find it at www.thebelfry, that's B-E-L-F-R-Y dot R-I-P. Yep. And so, of course, got to do our social media promotion. So, uh, very quickly, we have an Instagram, which is Gothcast. We have a Facebook, which is Gothcast. We have a website, it's gothcastradio.com, no WW, because who needs that? We have a YouTube channel which is gothcast space video and we also have an email which is gothcastradio at gmail.com and of course you can reach us at any of these mediums and we're always happy to respond and we're always happy to hear out requests or comments or you know even open up discussion we've had people contact us and give us their opinions on things and we're always happy to respond yeah we actually have a request to do some of the Valor Canned era of Christian death. So that should be interesting. Yeah. I know some of you might not care for Valor Canned as much as Roz Williams era Christian death, yeah. but we got to we gotta do the band justice. You know, we pretty much always will cover a band's entire career, and especially now that there's been a request for Valor Canned era. Yeah. It's, so, it's going to happen. <laughs> well, actually, one of the reasons that I think people want to hear about the Valor Canned era. Yep. And... Uh, it, it's kind of reasserted uh, when we got the request is that, yeah, like nobody knows about it. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I would <laughs> definitely agree with that. You know, everyone had sees pictures of Roz Williams all the time, everything, you know, whenever you search Christian death, it's always like Roz, Roz, Roz. And yeah, I could see why somebody would be like, hey, can you talk about the Valor Candor? Because there's like nothing out there. Like, and it's probably going to be, it's probably going to be one of those things where we have to do a ton of research beforehand yep. for it. I mean, we always do a lot of research, but I feel like for that one, it's actually going to be harder to find the information yeah so it should be interesting and uh, but if you have any other requests we also have another one but I'm gonna keep that one a little bit secret because it's probably gonna be a little ways out for yeah. the, um, the other requests that we have right now and but if you guys are a fan of the Valorcand era the Valorcand version well not exactly the same version but a Valorcand version of Christian Death still tours today yeah yeah they do so check it out just, yeah just look forward to that but like I said this has been Gothcast I'm Dr. Sanders I'm Robbie Gore and stay spooky.